Hey, what's going on people? It's Spencer here, and after a brief hiatus, we are back for another DTC Draft League video. We have some very long and very intense battles ahead, so we're going to be going through the highlights of Week 6, going through the scoreboard and kill leaders, then just get right into our feature battle. So let's go ahead and get started. With the standings being the Moon Division, the Philadelphia Fan Piece start off with a strong 6-0 against the Big Fat Groundons, as the Sao Paulo Dragonites come back with a narrow win versus the... Uh, Dallas Star Raptors with a 1-0. The Den Haag Daramakas also pull off a 1-0 versus the Memphis Grimmsnarls, while the Pittsburgh Pulte guys secure a 3-0 victory versus the Dutch Trampas. In the back half, the London Lux Rays take a 2-0 win against the Los Angeles Spark Surfers as the Destin Lucarios climb back to a 5-0 victory against the San Francisco 49 Tails. Lastly, the DC Duraldons score a 6-0 against the Avantime Flugels as the Ottawa Garchams round it out with a 4-0 win against the Tennessee Tyrantars. Uh, then going into the overall kill leaders of the week, uh, in the number one slot we have Mega Salamence with a 14 and 2 kill record. Number two, Arceus Ghost with a 14 and 3. Marshoto at number three with a 12 and 2 record, and Excadrill at number four with an 11 and 3 record. And then number five and number seven are all tied with Mega Metagross, Lando T, and Venusaur all with 8 and 2 records. So those are the overall kill leaders, and then we'll go into the specific kill leaders of the week. And then starting off with the number five slot here, we have Mark and his match against Ice. Um, so Mark's match, as always, is really going to be pivoting with the Genesis Act and finding opportunities to create some KOs. Um, so he's going to U-turn into the Gengar here, which is able to trap and use Shadow Ball. Uh, but the, yeah, the Toxapex just actually uses uh, a Shed Shell, so we can reveal that here. As is able to get off a Substitute, the Gengar, and fire off a Sludge Wave, which does some decent damage and poisons. Uh, but the Freeze Dry is able to break off the sub. Uh, and then later... Yeah, right here, the mark goes forward, Tres Barakuma reveals that it has um, HP Fire. As it does go below half the Fortress, but it does able to get off the rocks. Um, so obviously he's going to go double back into Clefable here. As Ice does remove the rocks and the T-Spikes, um, and it's just going to go right into Blissey. So getting off a wish here, obviously, for the Fortress is he's able to teleport back into it and basically safely go due to the Blissey not being able to touch it. As Articuno comes in once again, but Fortress is just going to get off another layer of rocks. Going back to Genesect, of course, here. Uh, going to U-turn now into the Fortress as he just goes into Articuno Ice as he's just able to get enough another layer of rocks, so kind of just repeating this trend here. <laughs> uh, the Articuno does reveal the, or rather Genesect reveals the Iron Head as it does so on Articuno and also reveals that it's not choice, so it gets a huge burn off on the Ferrothorn. And some nice chip damage, of course, uh, as he is just going to U-turn out into the Fortress, try to spin away those rocks, but uh, yeah, Ice just goes Zygarde here as he scouts the Ice Beam wisely. Does get a freeze off on the Toxapex, but it isn't going to matter too much because he's just going to thaw out and use a Scald. And then we can see, yep, removing the rocks basically here. Um, spinning on the Zygarde. And then able to get off a sub as he goes into Click Mabel Mark. But uh, a Moonblast is basically just going to remove that uh, substitute pretty easily. And then it won't be able to do too much damage. Uh, HP Ice from Rotom does break it significantly. So it does put it into complete form, but it is unable to get it behind a substitute, which is significant. Um, and then moving to turn, I think, 39, I want to say. The Genesect and Zygarde square off again. Uh, Ice tries to scout a U-turn from the bug and attempts to predict a switch by staying in. Uh, ends up proving pretty costly uh, because when he stays in, he goes down to an Ice Beam. Uh, and then Mark is able to safely U-turn back into Click Babel, setting up yet another wish to bring Fortress back to full. So again, just playing that momentum game. And then, of course, we see that Body Press come out from the Fortress, removing the Ferrothorn. Uh, as I think Gothoria attempts to stall and boost via Cosmic Power against Click Babel. But the lack of a Violite here, which Ice talks about later, uh, basically ends its potential early, so it's unable to sweep. Um, and then around turn 55, the Mega Gengar comes in. It's able to set up a Substitute and then Nasty Plot to max. So with the Blissey and Toxpex unable to break it, it's going to go down, and that's going to give Mark the 6-0 um, win, and then a 2-0 record for both Mega Gengar and Genesect. And then going into the next match here, we have Potion Seller versus Thomas. Um, pretty standard rain team, of course, for Thomas. He actually just goes for an immediate um, 
turn one memento there, trying to break down the curum, get up an opportunity for Toxicroak to come in and SD. Of course, the Toxicroak isn't going to do a terrible much to um, to Swampert, so a Poison Jab obviously there doesn't even break it past half as Earthquake takes down the Toxicroak. Pelipper is able to come out for relatively free as a U-turn safely into the Mega Swampert. Potion Seller just opts to let Frostmoth die here to the Stone Edge as Tapu Bulu can safely come in. It could take one of anything because it seems to be a bulky spread, and then Horde Leech is just be able to basically bring it up back to full. So gets the one kill there, uh, then goes just back into Swampert to take uh, any one of the hits that Kingdra is going to fire off. Um, Pelipper comes back in, but does get toxic as I believe around, uh, let's see, turn 12 or, yeah. Turn 12, he tries to lure, lure in Kingdra, and it does succeed, so he Dragon Pulses the Tapu Bulu. As Tapu Bulu here is just able to safely get off a play rough, which through the combination of toxic damage is going to take down the Pelipper. Um, and then from there, he goes, goes back into Swampert Potion Cellar, and basically a combination of Leftovers and Grassy Terrain is going to be able to you know, burn a few turns of rain, as well as give some recovery back for Swampert. So any of the moves it takes, it's going to be fine. Does unfortunately miss a Hydro Pump there, the Palkia, but not going to matter a huge much as the main objective here is just to stall out the rain. Does get a Toxic off for one more time as it does eventually go down to a Hydro Pump. And Tapu Bulu is going to come in here and it's going to be able to eat one Ice Beam as a play rough will just remove Palkia from uh, from six here or so there. And of course, uh, Kingdra does reveal a Flash Cannon and it goes down, but without the rain, it's going to be outsped by Kyurem and goes down to a uh, Freeze Dry. So pretty good 3-1 uh, kill record there for the Tapu Bulu. Pretty easy pressure, um, so good matchup there. We'll skip the next slot, which is going to be Raven's team. We'll discuss that a bit later, uh, as we're just going to go into Sam's match here versus Rufus. And this is pretty much a match of uh, both status and hazards as far as who can pressure the other. Uh, the Melodic and the Seismitoad trade Toxic for Rocks, as um, the Magirna here just tries to attempt to set up and see if it can pressure out the Melodic. Um, does eventually reveal the uh, Haze here, yep. As So the Magirna is going to be unable to really sweep to full potential, so it's going to be a potential problem for, uh, for Sam there. Um, basically just kind of unable to break through Melodic here as um, well, really all I could do is just Earth Power the Seismitoad uh, and eventually potentially get up some recovery with Scald via the Water Absorb and just catching those boosts. Um, so it does do it you know, once there. The only other way that Sam is able to successfully pressure the Melodic is essentially just chipping it down with um, Fold Switches. So you see there that uh, Crocodile is able to come in and get some rocks off uh, as the Seismitoad comes in once again and try to get off that uh, recovery via Water Absorb. Drapion sets itself up for a really nice opportunity here. It reels it's a scarf and has knockoff. So he's able to both knock off the Dragapult and then knock off the leftovers on the Xerneas. Uh, the Xerneas is able, of course, um, remove all the hazards as Crocodile itself gets off a knockoff on the Glycopod, which will be significant a bit later. Um, as again, Sam is just trying to continually pressure the Melodic. Uh, really the only thing you can do here is uh, make it waste some Scalds and make it waste some uh, recoveries. As the Magirna doesn't find a lot of opportunities to set up here, but the uh, yeah the Drapion does um, try to get off some chip damage. Again, trying to lure in the uh, the Scald recovery, which it does seem to be doing successfully. And yeah, just kind of toxic stalling and waiting for the pressure to kind of tick up. And then yeah, Drapion is able to get off a knockoff here, but isn't quite able to put it in range. However, the Toxic Spikes that I laid up previously are able to chip down and wear off the, uh, the Xerneas, which goes down to two knockoffs. Sam does opt to stay in and uh, kind of just repeatedly pressure Crocodile. Um, so he does trade that for his cro for Crocodile, um, as the Entei is now basically able to come in relatively for free, uh, so long as the Seismitoad is kind of weakened. Um, so that's going to be the main objective for Rufus here, is pressuring out that Seismitoad, as well as weakening the Rotom. Um, as I believe uh, Melodic is starting to lose some recoveries here. It's down to three or four uh, recoveries. Again, trying to check that uh, Scald damage. As the pressure is now really starting to wear down on the Glycopod because it lost its boots. Um, so it's going to go down to some rock damage there. As again, trying to pressure out with Volt Switch um, and the 
Earth Power is finally connecting, getting both a crit and a special defense drop, but of course the Haze is really going to mitigate that. Um, their lack of recovering now on Milotic means that it's going to go down to a combination of Burn and Earth Power, but the Toxic on uh, Seismitoad is going to take its toll. So, uh, Metagross here is able to get off two boosts with a Meteor Mash and take down the Pilot Swine, uh, but it is, is not able to break the... Um, the Rotom Heat. So does does go down to the overheat, but of course Entei is able to come in and pick off a weakened Rotom with a extreme speed. And also of course has the heavy duty boots. So very good match by Rufus there, some good prep. Uh, of course uh, Sam gets the kill lead here with a 3-1. Um, could have potentially won, but of course the Malak was just too bulky to really break through. Uh, so going into the next match here, our number one slot is going to be my match versus uh, Alux Hans and the Avantheim Flugels. So I open up with the Cragonal here and just kind of click a safe freeze dry. And then I think for the next turn, I just go for a uh, Como, just got the knockoff. I do see it, so it does not have the Darkest Larry, which is going to be significant later on. Uh, the next few turns of this match are pretty much just uh, scouting, or rather uh, pivoting and trying to create opportunities for the rest of my team, as well as just getting some chip damage generally. Uh, a parting shot is going to kind of mitigate the opportunity for me to set up with um, Como as I just go for Cragonal safely. Fortunately, there's a crit on that, um, a crit on the Hurricane, but Arceus is able to come, set, uh, come up and set up safely here because I know the uh, Incineroar does not have Darkest Lair yet, so it's probably not offensive. Uh, I'm able to set up two Calm Mines here to kind of mitigate the damage that Clydeser is going to be able to do as I'm able to safely recover and then eventually get off a, um, a third boost here. So even a crit at this rate is probably not going to do a ton to me, as I'm just trying to safely recover to a uh, to around 100%, or at least to 75 or so. Uh, finally firing off of Judgment at plus 3 is able to, going, to, going to be able to remove it, as uh, Tornius does reveal it has the Dark Pulse here, which is quite significant, but uh, not enough, of course, to do enough damage. Tries to get a Hurricane, maybe to confuse me, but again, one shot is going to do enough. Um, as I do reveal the Earth Power here, which is my coverage for Incineroar, and then the actually the nine tails reveals it's scarfed, which is pretty interesting, uh, as it fires off a dark pulse, but again isn't able to break. Uh, and then of course the rest of the team here is going to go down to my judgments from Arceus. So uh, pretty straightforward match, I would say. Uh, just the main point of that was um, kind of coming down to creating opportunities for Arceus to come in, scouting Incineroar for Darkest Lyria, and then finally be able to be in a safe enough position to set up and sweep. So that's going to be the number one kill leader is Arceus with the six zero. And then going to the feature match, which I actually skipped from earlier, it's going to be Raven versus Malik Pai in a very long and very intense but very good match. So I'll kind of just be skipping around here and uh, explaining the process. So in turns one to seven, Malik Pai starts with the an early initiative, letting Gistrodon catch a Storm Drain boost and whittle down Type Nolan to rest, and gives the opposing Vesper Quinn a chance to set up some T-Spikes and prompts Raven's Corviknight to defog them away. And then in turns 12 to 17, Raven opts to get a chunk of, on Gastrodon, outraging it to put in two at KO range. Uh, but Malik goes into Whimsicott to block the second hit, so it sets up behind a sub, and then uh, I believe seeds the Corviknight. Uh, so kind of bringing back a rotation of Gastrodon and ho -Oh to try to pressure out the um, pressure out his team there. Um, and then closer, it turns 25 to 41, the two teams trade pressure. Lee Tai attempts to bring out T-Spikes while pressuring out Corviknight with ho -Oh but only light blows are traded and a series of pivots are made. Uh, so nothing too terribly significant here, essentially just doing some chip damage. And then skipping around to turn 43, uh, Whimsicott reveals Taunt as its third move, so that'll be significant for later. As if we skip to turn 58, uh, the Dracovish comes in on Ho-Oh, gets poisoned from Team Skies, prompting Gastrodon to come back in, but Raven extra reveals it's a rest talking set, making Leak Pie's goal of wearing down the team through toxic pressure a lot more difficult. Um, and then closer to turn 68, uh, the Corviknight comes in to get up a light screen, then goes back into Type Null, but the Reunclist reveals uh, Call Mine, so it's got some boosting there. Uh, it does get a Spadef drop off on the Type Null, so it's going to make it more difficult to uh, come in safely, but Reunclist's only attack is the Psychic, so it goes um, takes quite a bit from Dark Pulse and Flinches, so it's going to be able to, or going to be forced to switch out there um, in that particular matchup. And then if we skip to turn 139 here, um, Malik Pai does bring out the Reunclist once again, this time revealing the Iron Defense, and gets off also two Calm Mines before eventually the Greninja comes in. Again, Greninja does not care about any of its moves, so it's just going to take this opportunity to set up two layers of T-Spikes uh, before Corv comes back in to set up a Light Screen, and just kind of use some pressure on the Reunclist there. 
And then skipping to turn 154 with the T-Spikes up, the match basically becomes a repeat game of pivoting and pressure, both like literally and the ability, with Raven attempting to bring out more Mons to get poison while Malik Pai tries to find out opportunities to get up Reunclus. Um, so essentially, neither one can touch the other for a significant part of the match. So it becomes a game of how to preserve the Mons while still maintaining the momentum of the game. Um, so that is essentially the kind of truncated version of these turns, but we'll go ahead and jump to turn 216. Um, and this is where Rimzakar reveals its last move to be Nature Power, so it means it's not carrying Moonblast for Dracovish, and this later means that Dracovish can click Outrage without having too much consequence, so proving to be very significant later on. And then if we jump to 231, I believe, um, after a Storm Drain boost for Gastro, um, it does pressure out the Corviknight. Um, I believe at this point Raven was saying that um, there was a grass knot was was on the um, the Greninja, so it did have an opportunity to remove the Gastrodon there, but decides to go for T spikes instead as the Gastrodon revealed Mirror Coat. So it could have ended the game slightly early, but Raven opted for long term pressure rather than an immediate KO, which is an interesting decision, but ultimately um, helps him with the match. So again, kind of more of the same here, switching out a lot, trying to pressure out PP. Um, so not a whole lot going on here. Uh, we'll go ahead and skip to turn uh, 351. Uh, so Aromatisse removes poisons for itself, and this is where it can fire off um, One Last Wish, I believe, um, as it is able to get off the heal bellow as well to heal uh, the team of uh, status. And then turn uh, 365, I believe. Uh, it does, uh, Type Null is able to switch back into Dracovish here. And Dracovish is able to fully recover. Um, doesn't care a lot about Earth Power. The significant part here is that Gastrodon does get poisoned, so really it's just being put on a timer and being forced to be go back into Vespiquin because Vespiquin is the cleric for, for Malik Pai's team. So kind of the most significant part of the match there is uh, getting poison off on Malik Pai's grounded mons and just switching back and forth, taking resisted hits and hoping that you can PP stall uh, the rest of, of Malik Pai's team. And then turn uh, 374 here, yeah, Raven does get a crit with the returns, but it is able to reinforce the able to get off some boosts. Although the goal of Type Null here is essentially just to roar out the um, Mega Sableye, which got healed of its poisoned earlier. So the goal is to poison that, get some accumulative damage off on it. And then if we jump to turn uh, 401, here uh, the Whimsicott comes in uh, from a roar, and then uh, Dracovish does come in. Um, which is already sleeping currently. So the key here is whether or not Dracovish is going to be able to hit uh, any of its, you know, the key move here to be hit to hit would be um, Outrage. So it does it is able to fire off an Outrage and put Gastrodon under one third. Uh, so this is going to make Gastrodon's life a lot more difficult as far as successfully recovering. Of course, uh, Dracovish is going to be locked into Outrage. So it's going to do that on the Whimsicott. Uh, and now the Dracovish uh, because it's not confused, is able to fire off a Fish's Rend, or rather because it's not locked into the move, can fire off Fish's Rend, as uh, a combination of Fish's Rend plus the toxic damage is actually going to remove the Whimsicott. So the first one to go down in like 400 turns is is that. Um, Fish's Rend does connect on Gastrodon, um, so getting that boost again, but really Raven is able to safely step up in here because there's no moves that can uh, damage it, of course, uh, or damage it significantly. Uh, Ho is really just trying to pressure out outrages and recover some of that damage, get it confused, of course. As Reunclus comes in, takes a full Ficious Rend, um, and really unable to recover here. Whoops, uh, if we skip to turn 416, I believe. Uh, so essentially, Vish, Vish is able to clean through both Reunclus, um, bring under a fourth before it connects for a second time, and then. Uh, again, with the Outrage KO on ho later on, but the accumulated poison damage it takes uh, basically takes this toll and brings the brings the Pokemon down, so you see the poison connecting there, and then eventually um, able to go down through combination of Earthquake damage and Outrage. So that's how it goes down, but with the Pokemon Gastrodon and Mega Sableye thoroughly weathered down, Moonblast is going to be able to safely put uh, Sableye in range, and then finally, the Gastrodon is uh, already weak enough to go down to a Moonblast. So, a very long game. Uh, overall, this match really demonstrated how to play play the long game and how best to preserve Mons. So, clearly, Raven built his team with that in mind. He had two Mons with Rest Talk. He had a Cleric. T-Spikes obviously being a really reliable way of putting consistent pressure on Malik Pai's team. 
And of course, Malik Pai too opted for a similar strategy. So beyond Vespa Quinn, um, kind of lacked a true cleric, but the lack of Dracovish, a lack of pressure on Dracovish rather, ultimately cost him the match. So a very good match, very well played match, nonetheless, by both of them. But uh, yeah, Raven able to eat got a win there. Really impressive. Uh, but that's really going to be it, guys, for for this. Uh, this week uh so that'll be the highlights of week six uh of course i want to give a big shout out to rucker over at dtc for handling the last few weeks of highlights so if you missed out on any and you want to see more be sure to check out his channel at king rucker we'll have both some of the a-league highlights as well as all the b-league ones and of course if you like this content and you want to see more be sure to like and subscribe and of course let me know if you enjoy this format or if you want me to drop certain segments so like always continue to uh, support and enjoy the dtc draft league and i will see you all next time